Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and it gives me a great deal of pleasure, as well as substantive anticipation, to be hosting a speech today by Brett Nyman, counselor to the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, on the topic of sovereign debt. Uh, sovereign debt uh, is a word that, for aficionados, is very charged and may sound a bit abstract to some, but it's a genuinely high stakes life and death matter for many people out of, around the world, um, particularly in developing countries. And it has been an issue of recurring concern to US treasuries and to other governments, borrowers and lenders alike for decades. Um, and the current treasury is now creating its own agenda and I'm very grateful to both Brent and the Treasury itself for sending him our way uh, to explain what their current thinking is on this critical issue. Uh, this is, in a sense, the first event of several we'll be having in the run-up to the uh, annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF in the coming weeks, but it is standalone uh, an important discussion of a critical topic. And for that, again, uh, we are glad to hear and know that Brent Nyman is not only serving as counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury, but is the Biden administration's nominee for the Assistant Secretary of International Finance and the Deputy Undersecretary. As Assistant Secretary for International Finance, and so within the limits of a non-confirmed counselor at the moment, he is engaging in a broad variety of international economic priorities, including digital assets regulation, responding as part of the team to Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, and Treasury's policy stance on international monetary policy and exchange rates and debt today. Before joining the Treasury and presumably afterwards, he is on leave as the Edward Eagle Brown Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. He's a very distinguished academic doing a great deal of applied empirical work. We at the Peterson Institute have both learned from him and cited him often on his work in the area of um, international economics, and in particular, some of the work he's done on asset flows across the world. Um, he's previously worked as a senior staff economist for international finance uh, at the Council of Economic Advisors and at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, I'm not going to go through all his qualifications, but he holds a Bachelor's from UPenn, a master's in mathematical modeling from Oxford, and received his PhD in economics from Harvard. Most importantly, he is a passionate and thoughtful advocate for reform in the area of international sovereign debt. And with that, I'd like to invite Brett Nyman to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Adam, uh, <clears throat> for that kind introduction and for, for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here in particular. I last gave a talk uh, a couple of years ago at PIIE wearing my, my previous hat as an academic. And one great thing I noticed then and that you, you immediately noticed uh, when talking to, to Peterson experts, to talking to Peterson affiliates, is that in addition to the economic theory, there's a real attention and concern with uh, details, practical details, institutional and otherwise, that can constitute the difference uh, between a successful policy and an unsuccessful policy. And now in my current hat at Treasury, I have an even more visceral appreciation for that reality, including when it comes to cross-border lending and, and cross-border borrowing. Uh, I thought therefore this would be a, a great place to, to discuss uh, some practical ways that we can do both better. Uh, developing and emerging markets were in a different spot, a difficult spot at the start of the year. COVID-19, uh, the pandemic had led to a 2% fall in their collective output in 2020, which is the first overall contraction in the post-war era. Governments appropriately borrowed and spent to weather the shock and fight back against the disease. Their debt levels jumped from 54% of GDP before COVID to 64% by the end of last year. And then at this time of great vulnerability, 
Russia unleashed its brutal and unjustified war against Ukraine. The war has caused food and energy prices to jump. It's accelerated inflation around the world. And as advanced economies, central banks have raised rates, cross-border investment flows have retrenched. Net outflows across emerging markets in the first quarter of 2022 were the largest seen since the global financial crisis. The dollar in real terms has appreciated the levels not seen in several decades. Together, these ingredients all but assure debt distress in a number of countries. We've seen the recent images of social unrest in Sri Lanka. While the specter of a systemic sovereign debt crisis has not materialized, the difficult global conditions are amplifying domestic vulnerabilities and economic stresses are appearing year may be to come. In the short run following some episodes of distress, we should be ready to quickly deliver assistance, doing things like potentially repurposing existing programs to fill urgent needs. But what can be done to help after that? And what can be done ahead of time in the first place to reduce the likelihood that these events occur? Today, I'd like to discuss the logic behind working together to resolve unsustainable debts, why multilateral restructuring has in practice become more difficult, and how roadblocks in that process prevent countries from being able to take advantage of the international financial institutions that we've all worked so hard to build uh, together. I'll suggest some concrete steps that creditors, borrowers, and the global community can take, stopping some practices and ramping up others to achieve better outcomes now and into the future. Let me start by noting that it's a good thing that developing countries and emerging markets can borrow from abroad, and we should continue to pursue policies that allow them to do so. These countries have less capital per worker than advanced economies, and so have many investment opportunities that produce high and offer high economic and social returns. And given their incomes will be higher in the future, it makes good sense for these countries to finance these opportunities with foreign capital. Not to mention the additional benefits that can be carried by cross-border investment, such as positive technology transfers. These financial flows are also a good thing for the United States. They can offer our citizens and our companies a chance to diversify risks, finance projects that are complementary to domestic production, and more generally deepen cultural and commercial ties. Of course, macro shocks and other unpredictable developments can stress the sustainability of this borrowing. For many countries, such stresses can be resolved by pursuing the appropriate reforms, perhaps involving the IMF or others without any need to restructure. But for countries with debt loads that significantly exceed the value of what's likely to be repaid, a condition referred to as debt overhang, we have a now standard playbook. The first step in the playbook is to reduce the country's external debts to make sure the borrower doesn't forego useful projects. After all, with debt overhang and no restructuring, some of the return to those future investments will go toward repaying the existing creditors, and that can lead to underinvestment. It's in the country's interests and also in the collective interests of the creditors to avoid this outcome. You might ask, given the alignment of interests, won't the creditors on their own offer the efficient level of relief? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Together, the creditors might benefit from restoring sustainability and allowing the country to obtain new financing to pursue high return activities. But individually, each creditor would rather be repaid in full and let the others take losses. Further, some creditors focused on their own interests may prefer deeper cuts to local spending than what a global social planner might prescribe. Much of the international financial architecture developed over the past several decades aims to deal with exactly these incentive and collective action problems. The Paris Club, for example, was formed to coordinate debt restructuring among bilateral creditors. And similarly, the London Club was formed to organize commercial bank creditors. Once a borrower makes a good faith effort to restructure its private debts, and official bilateral creditors provide financing assurances 
which are promises that they'll sufficiently restructure what's owed to them, we reach the second step, which is an agreed IMF program. The IMF can then provide lending, coupled with conditionality and expertise, to help the country restore macroeconomic stability and catalyze fresh lending for high return activities and growth. I don't mean to make it sound so easy, nor to imply that these elements are sufficient for a good outcome. It's only natural that there may be imperfections when countries work with the IMF to design and implement program, uh, programs. And of course, additional shocks and uncertainties often intervene. But having this playbook in place and ready to deploy has been good for the world. Will this playbook work now if we see a new wave of debt crises among developing and emerging market countries? Four major challenges, excuse me, four major changes in the international lending landscape over the past decade have strained its efficacy. First, the debt burdens of developing and emerging market countries has risen considerably. Second, use of non-traditional arrangements, things like collateralized borrowing has proliferated. Third, private sector creditors have grown in importance. And fourth, while many official creditors have shifted their focus toward offering grants, non-traditional official creditors have increased their lending to developing and emerging markets. In particular, China has vastly expanded its portfolio of loans and trade credits, and it's now by far the largest bilateral official creditor in the world. All these elements have introduced new complexities to the needed coordination among creditors in debt restructuring. My remarks will focus on some steps that creditors, borrowers, and the international financial institutions should take in response. One important change in the creditor landscape stems from how China restructures its bilateral debts. Chinese policy and commercial banks typically rely on limited cash flow treatments and do not write down large losses. Researchers have found that the majority of Chinese debt relief deals have come with significant delays and have not reduced the borrower country's nominal debt burden. Instead, the deals involve lengthening maturities or grace periods, and in fewer cases, interest rate reductions or new financing. Only four cases since 2000 have reportedly involved haircuts on Chinese official debt. And in some cases, such as the Republic of Congo in 2018, debt restructurings have even increased the net present value of China's loans. As a result, the restructurings typically do not resolve the debt overhang and can stoke uncertainty about the need for repeated rescheduling in the future. Does the approach of any one country in this process matter all that much? In fact, China's enormous scale as a lender means its participation is essential. Estimates of the total stock of outstanding Chinese official loans range widely from roughly $500 billion to $1 trillion, concentrated in low- and middle-income countries. China became the world's largest official creditor in 2017, surpassing the claims of the World Bank, the IMF, and all Paris Club official creditors combined. A recent study estimates that as many as 44 countries now owe debt equivalent to more than 10% of their GDP to Chinese lenders after factoring both on and off balance sheet liabilities. Failure to act on these debts could imply years of ongoing difficulties with the servicing of debts and with underinvestment and lower growth in low and middle income countries. In November of 2020, the G20 established the common framework to bring China and other non paris club creditors into a multilateral effort to restructure the debts of low-income countries on a case-by-case -case basis. This helpful instance of global economic cooperation carried the hope that by bringing all creditors together, the common framework would result in needed debt treatments in a timely and orderly fashion. However, that ambition has not yet materialized. There have been three common framework cases to date. In the case of Chad, China delayed the formation of a creditor committee. And in the case of Ethiopia, it delayed the formation of a creditor committee until it was clear that the IMF program would expire and discussions on a debt treatment would not take place because of the conflict. China did join the creditor committee for Zambia, but only after six months of delays following the staff level agreement with the IMF. Encouragingly, 
China announced in late July that it and other official bilateral creditors would provide Zambia with debt treatments, and the IMF approved a three-year lending program for Zambia on August 31st. But even if, as I hope, the situations ultimately improve in all three countries, those delays carried suffering and uncertainty may discourage others from requesting needed treatments in the future and overall preclude the best outcomes. Successful efforts under the common framework so far have, alas, been uncommon. Progress has also been slow on debt restructuring for middle-income countries outside of the common framework. Furthermore, China has engaged in unconventional practices that have allowed the IMF to move forward in several recent cases without obtaining standard financing assurances. For example, in 2020, China agreed to $2.4 billion in new lending as a financing assurance for Ecuador's IMF program and to offset upcoming interest payments due to Chinese creditors, even as private creditors agreed to a $17.4 billion debt restructuring. However, Rather than delivering the promised new financing in a matter of months, China only came to terms with Ecuador this past week. In Suriname, China and India have so far failed to provide financing assurance for the IMF that it considers specific and credible, leading to the IMF's reliance on an unusual application of its policy to move forward with a program. In the case of Argentina, China is not, uh, not restructuring debt service while Paris Club creditors are likely to do so. And China has opted instead to promise net financing by offering new loans. In many of these cases, China is not the only creditor holding back quick and effective implementation of the typical playbook. But across the international landscape, China's lack of participation in coordinated debt relief is the most common and it's the most consequential. The immediate priority for creditors is to conclude the pending common framework cases as quickly as possible. We're also open to expanding the common framework to middle income countries and should prioritize discussions of ideas, including those offered by new creditors to boost the speed and predictability of the process. Creditors should also focus on making their lending more transparent since a lack of clear information on borrowers indebtedness makes lending to that borrower riskier ex ante and makes resolutions more difficult ex post. G7 countries have largely met their, commi their commitments to publish their direct lending portfolios on a loan by loan basis. And at US Treasury, we've greatly improved our own online foreign credit reporting system. G20 creditors should also follow the norms for financing terms and contractual clauses that they endorsed in 2018. A number of features common in China's lending reduce transparency or differ from these international norms in ways that exacerbate the coordination problem in multilateral restructurings. Chinese loan contracts often contain non-disclosure agreements. As a result, liabilities to China are systematically excluded from multilateral surveillance or restructuring efforts. One study found that all contracts with Chinese state-owned entities after 2014, contain strong confidentiality clauses that prevent the borrower from disclosing any terms unless required to do so by law. Chinese loan contracts also commonly feature novel clauses that allow Chinese lenders to cancel loans and demand immediate repayment in a wide variety of circumstances. Collaterals included in up to half of all Chinese loan contracts and arrangements for repayment commonly include escrow accounts. All these elements limit a borrower's ability to engage in standard multilateral restructuring processes. And they incentivize the borrower to cut side deals on a more generous term with the Chinese creditor. In fact, around three fourths of all Chinese debt contracts contain clauses that expressly commit the borrower to exclude Chinese debt from Paris Club restructurings or from any comparable debt treatment. Countries that seek a Paris Club restructuring find themselves either having to violate the terms of their borrowing from China or violate the principle of comparability of treatment. Additional problems may stem from institutional fragmentation within China's internal lending bureaucracy. In contrast to the typical practice among traditional official creditors, debt distress appears to be managed by the specific Chinese creditor rather than by the Ministry of Finance 
or an agency that is not the lender, like the People's Bank of China. But Chinese policy banks and state-owned commercial banks don't report directly to the Ministry of Finance or the People's Bank of China. And as a result, they've often been unable to provide details on behalf of the creditor banks on a debt treatment for the purposes of providing financing assurances to the IMF. This institutional fragmentation can also keep China's lenders from coordinating on an assessment of borrowers' debt sustainability prior to extending loans. Some of these institutional frictions may simply reflect the fact that China has grown so rapidly as a creditor. And some are only natural, given China is so new to the restructuring process. That said, there are many ways that China could quickly reduce these frictions. In addition to improving its own tracking and transparency of all its foreign lending, China might consider implementing different financial structures, such as the creation of a sovereign asset management entity or bad bank, as a way to allow the various creditor agencies to isolate distressed loans. Specialized management expertise could then bring, uh, then focus on restructuring, while the development banks and other lending institutions are freed up to return to their normal focus. With the right design features, such a structure might restore incentives toward resolving, rather than holding out, and troubled debts. A useful parallel may be made with reforms to the Chinese bankruptcy system. Amid large increases in corporate debt and bankruptcies, China reformed its corporate bankruptcy code in 2007 and introduced specialized courts over the following decade. And research suggests these actions led to an increase in the scale and speed of resolutions and boosted productivity in China. Changes in institutional structure or legal and management practices related to the restructuring of China's external debts as part of the multilateral process would not only benefit low-income borrowers around the world, but could also benefit China itself. Private creditors also could do more to improve their own transparency. The OECD launched the Debt Transparency Initiative in 2021 to operationalize the voluntary principles for debt transparency that were helpfully put together by the Institute for International Finance, but few have so far participated. As with many of these suggestions, by reducing risk, information frictions, and coordination problems, such steps not only help borrowers, but can also benefit the creditors themselves. What can borrowers do? Well, borrowers can, of course, take their own steps to maximize the likelihood that if they do end up in debt distress, they can obtain relief and restore stability and growth, including with an IMF program. The antidote to non-disclosure by creditors is transparency by borrowers, and a number of countries have made remarkable progress on this dimension. Benin strengthened its level of debt disclosure by creating a debt portal and extending the coverage of its debt statistics. Regular trainings and interaction with the World Bank and the IMF have improved capacity. Along with prudent macro fiscal policies, Benin's reputation in markets strengthened sufficiently that it was able to access and issue international debts, uh, access international markets and issue international, international debt even in the middle of the pandemic. Burkina Faso, with the help of the bank and the fund, last year issued its first statistical debt bulletin that meets international debt best practices and includes detailed information on loan terms, and conditions. It includes government direct debt, guarantees, and public-private partnership contracts. Madagascar, in 2014, adopted a law on public debt and guarantees that introduces reporting requirements, including to their parliament. As the sovereign debt expert Anna Gelpern has suggested, more countries should consider passing laws requiring their governments to, in essence, make their public debt public. With a clearer picture of their own consolidated external liabilities, borrowers could implement measures that minimize the likelihood of individual ministries or state-owned enterprises from contracting unsustainable debts. Many low-income countries already have legal provisions that require authorization of all public sector borrowing by the central government, and more should consider doing so. Some, including West African countries such as Cote d'Ivoire and Gambia, have gone further by allowing their central government to impose debt limits on all public entities. Borrowers should look around, evaluate which types of arrangements produce positive long-run outcomes, and exercise caution when agreeing to unusual contract terms. 
If a borrower country has an abundance of labor that's qualified to work on infrastructure, is there a good reason to agree to only deploy foreign workers on financed projects requiring standard construction skills? Is there a good reason for payments to be made via an offshore escrow account that can be controlled by the creditor? Borrowers might further enhance their sharing of information and best practices with technical level regional dialogues and conferences, including presentations by experts in procurement, project audits, and debt management. For example, the Uruguay Chamber of Construction recently held a conference promoting international best practices in public contracting that brought together experts from across the world to share their experiences. Government officials, financial and legal experts, and construction and infrastructure firms shared their perspective on how, at each stage of the procurement life cycle, decisions should not entirely reflect price, but also the quality and anticipated return of the projects and the social benefit brought to the local community. What should multilater multilaterals and the rest of the world do? Well, we should continue to support initiatives that foster sustainable lending practices and transparency, like the G20's guidelines or the OECD and IIF's debt transparency initiative, and we should also continue to support uh, the provision of capacity building assistance to developing countries, such as through the World Bank Debt Management Facility. We should build on recent successes, such as the adoption of enhanced collection, collective action clauses in bond contracts to minimize coordination problems and reduce disruption from holdout creditors. The G7 private sector working group led by the UK is making helpful progress in developing templates, for example, for majority voting provisions that serve a similar pur uh, purpose as collective action clauses do, but for non-bonded debt. We might also strive to create deeper markets for well-designed state contingent securities, which could reduce the need for these debt restructurings in the first place. Borrowing countries should issue whatever securities are best suited to their needs, but we should continue efforts to brainstorm, create, and stress test contract templates whether the ideas come from the private sector or from the official sector, such as the climate resilient debt instruments that are currently also being worked on by the private sector working group. We must minimize the chances that the IMF provides financing that could ultimately be used to repay select creditors. The IMF and World Bank's debt sustainability analyses constitute the core of efforts to coordinate and overcome debt overhang modeling quantitatively the needed policies and potentially debt treatments. The expanding set of creditors and complexity of lending approaches may have made it more difficult, but the IMF must remain vigilant so that restructurings both meet the terms of the DSAs and are promised with financing assurances that hit the IMF standard of specific and credible, especially for creditors without a robust track record of meeting that standard. Details about financing assurances their form, their scale, their provenance, et cetera, should be more transparently reported uh, and could be tracked in staff reports. All official bilateral creditors must ultimately be treated equally in these restructurings. Finally, we should increase the scale of high quality development financing, particularly through the multilateral development banks by stretching their existing resources and using them to mobilize private capital. Doing so would not only advance our development goals, but also has the added benefit of providing borrower countries with a stronger set of alternatives when considering loans with potentially onerous terms. As I mentioned earlier, official bilateral creditors led by China and France agreed in late July to offer debt treatment for Zambia. This is a great step, but it's only the first step toward finalizing technical deal details and actually delivering that relief. Now that the IMF program for Zambia has been approved, it's vital that creditors move expeditiously to hash out and then transparently meet the terms of the debt treatment. And Zambia is not the only pressing case. As I mentioned, Sri Lanka urgently needs a debt restructuring and unfortunately is not eligible for the common framework. On September 1st, Sri Lanka reached a staff level agreement with the IMF on a robust set of policies to restore economic stability. In order to bring this lending program forward, creditors now need to step up to negotiate a debt treatment that's in line with this economic program. We're now in new territory, but the coming weeks offer a real opportunity for progress. 
borrowers, lenders, and multilaterals all have a role to play. Swiftly concluding the first common framework case, and making clear progress on multilateral restructuring for middle-income countries outside of the framework would be a big win, not only for current and future debtors and their citizens, but also for all official creditors, whether traditional ones or new ones. We must build on recent experiences, apply these lessons learned, and push ahead in these cases to prevent any depreciation from our international financial infrastructure. Thank you so much, Brent. I invite you on stage and ask you to turn on your lapel mic. Thank you for giving our audience and therefore the world a uh, look into the committed strategy that you and the Treasury wish to pursue. Um, can I pick up in that direction? As, as you well know, and your colleagues at Treasury well know, this is an issue for which, going back to the 70s and 80s, there have been recurring attempts to affect borrowers, lenders, and the multinationals. Um, how do you see the initiatives you're proposing fitting in to this history of attempts by Treasury and other governments to change the system? Um, Yes, yeah, so, so the issue, the, I mean, the idea that sometimes you need debt restructurings, that sometimes this requires multilateral coordination and that this coordination can be more difficult in an international context is a, a very old issue um, that of course we and partners around the world have, have been working on for decades. Um, you know, the, the Paris Club I mentioned is, is more than 60 years old now. And we of course uh, have participated in the Paris Club you know, for a long time. Um, and, you know, uh, around the, um, after essentially the experiences in the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, Treasury and the world uh, embarked on, for instance, the HIPAA initiative um, based on the experiences that shallow restructurings that occurred in the 80s and 90s didn't produce lasting outcomes that eliminated the debt overhang and resulted in good growth trajectories, um, you know, essentially opted for grants over loans. Um, We've, of course, worked on uh, this topic in the context of uh, Treasury's leadership on promoting collective action clauses, um, you know, starting in the early 2000s, for example, as a way to try to more automatically overcome these coordination um, issues. Um, but then came COVID, and you know, there was an awareness by the, the G20, so the United States, uh, Paris Club countries, and, and also non-Paris Club countries like China, came together recognizing the, the difficulties in the potential debt dynamics for low-income countries and said, you know, let's try and find a way uh, to improve this coordination problem to get around it. And so, you know, the common framework uh, uh, was created. And uh, it's in that context that I think we find our, our, ourselves today not having seen progress against this very important initiative. I wouldn't describe the speech I just gave as uh, about the pursuit of a, of a brand new broad agenda or you know, highlighting some brand new theoretical issue. Uh, rather, a goal was to lay out in simple and clear uh, terms some of the facts uh, as we see it that have impeded progress on this very important uh, initiative that, that all of the G20 uh, agreed to pursue. And, and I wanted to focus on what I see as some, some very implementable steps uh, that, that creditors and borrowers and multilaterals can take get back to progress um, and deliver on that promise. And if I may return the kind compliment you made towards the Peterson Institute Agent, the idea that you're thinking in terms of what are the practical steps in the current situation is, I think, very valuable. I wasn't asking you so much what's new, but just to contextualize it. But in that context, could we maybe just go back a bit to some of the specific country cases that you read? I mean, you mentioned what's gone on over the last couple of years with Chad, with Ethiopia, with Zambia, with Argentina. You mentioned the urgent needs in Sri Lanka, for example. I'm not so much asking you to give a litany of what, who's, who's in trouble, um, but more in the spirit of what you just said, Brent, what, what should those of us on the outside be looking for as the precedents or the signs of progress in the upcoming countries in difficulty? Where do you think China or others from the G20 might be more willing to, to help is sort of a bit more on what's coming up. 
Yeah, I, I, I guess I would think of there as being kind of three buckets that we should keep an eye on. You know, as I mentioned, I think the, the immediate priority, the, the place where I hope we can, in very short order, see progress would be Zambia. And Zambia is particularly important because it could serve as a proof of concept that uh, the common framework could work and how it would work. Um, you know, again, uh, the, the board approved uh, Zambia's program on, October, on August 31st. So, you know, we're hoping uh, that we could see a memorandum of understanding and progress in Zambia. You know, for example, by the end of the year, we would hope um, if that is successful and moves ahead, the next thing I would be looking for is countries that, that hopefully come forward and ask for treatments under the common framework. Um, I think that for that reason, this is a particularly important case to set that precedent and show that we can overcome some of these hurdles and, and make, you know, deliver on that promise uh, that we all agreed to uh, in the G20. Outside of the common framework, uh, you know, the, the an important case right now is, of course, Sri Lanka. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is going through a very difficult time. Um, and right now, it's up to the, the creditors, um, including non uh, Paris Club creditors. China is a very important creditor in the Sri Lankan case. Have to get together and make progress um, around, uh, uh, you know, agreeing uh, to a treatment for for Sri Lankan case. Um, the third, sort of broad category of things I'd be looking for are outside of individual restructurings, but rather with an eye toward future restructuring. Some of the things I mentioned in the speech are things that borrowers can do right now uh, as they're considering entering into new borrowing agreements or managing their current. Uh, you know, uh, sort of a portfolio of external borrowing. Um, do we see improvements in the short term as measured, let's say, by the World Bank's heat map on debtor transparency? Um, do we see additional information sharing um, and coordination among borrowing countries to increase their capacity uh, to minimize the chances that in the future they find themselves uh, in a position where they have any need for multilateral restructuring um, and, and find that that point that some of these elements of their previous agreements uh, limit their ability to, to do that. Great. Um, you have mentioned multiple times Paris Club, which, as you said, goes back six decades for official bilateral lenders. But as you've also emphasized, I think rightly, we're in a different context now. There are different kinds of governments involved. There are different kinds of semi-state, semi-private financial institutions. There are non-commercial bank institutions. Um, is there on the table efforts to broaden the membership of the Finance Club, of the Paris Club, excuse me, to bring in others? Or is the emphasis now on just people are where they are, we just want to work on the common framework? You know, we, we very much believe in and support some of the core principles that underlie the Paris Club. Principles like you know, information sharing, comparability of treatment, I mentioned. And so to the extent countries um, you know, agree with those principles, uh, we've, we've been in the past for a long time now supportive of inviting countries to join uh, you know, to, together with our partners in the Paris Club. Um, you know, in the past, Treasury had been very supportive of, of South Korea and Brazil uh, joining the Paris Club. Um, and uh, you know, we've been in the past, in the recent past, supportive of enhanced engagement by China and by South Africa uh, with the Paris Club. And we're, we're, of course, supportive of the current process by which South Africa is aiming to um, become a full member of the Paris Club. Um, a part of the, the, the gains, the progress that I think we made uh, when the G20 formed the common uh, framework was to uh, also look for ways in which we could improve this multilateral coordination outside of, of, of just enlarging uh, participation in the Paris Club. And, and that's why I think that's you know, probably the first thing at the top of our list that we should make sure uh, to, to be trying to, to keep our eyes on and push ahead as, as quickly as we can. That mechanism, which allows for cooperation between Paris Club and non-Paris Club uh, creditors. Thank you. Um, in your speech, uh, clearly, you're placing considerable emphasis on China's failures to fully participate in the common framework, despite the framework having been adopted by the G20, meaning including China. Um, and you gave some illustrations of how Chinese policy has delayed the restructuring process in some critical cases. Um, so two questions related to that. First, um, could the IMF 
apply its lending into arrears policy a little differently or more aggressively to not so much maybe put pressure on China, but to reduce their ability to delay restructuring. And more broadly, I know you're talking to Chinese counterparts and, and as is Secretary Yellen and the under, under Secretary Shambaugh and others. Um, beyond trying to persuade Chinese officials just through reason discourse of a desire for change, what other points of leverage or initiatives or incentives might the U.S. government take? Yeah, so um, maybe starting with the IMF role part of the question. First, the IMF, of course, uh, can play a role in advising countries in the run-up to, to finding themselves in potential times of, of debt distress uh, or potential restructuring. But, but once, you know, in the context of a restructuring, the IMF, of course, can advise participants. Um, but, but we would be supportive of the IMF you know, encouraging both sides on process, um, being proactive in, for example, making sure there's clarity on technical details everyone's on board with the assumptions and understands the key assumptions underlying their debt sustainability uh, analysis, things like that. Um, we also think that the IMF, uh, you know, as I mentioned, sort of needs to remain vigilant about financing assurances, um, needs to and should consider being more transparent with the membership on, uh, you know, perhaps including some information, for instance, in staff reports on the nature of the financing assurances that are given and, and following up on it. Um, um, you know, if those financing assurances aren't ultimately uh, you know, produced or delivered, uh, or the financing is not delivered consistent with the assurances. And we do think it's important for the IMF to take into account previous creditor behavior in terms of follow through on those assurances when, when judging assurances in the future uh, to hit their standard of credible and specific. The lending into arrears policy you know, a, a, a priority for us is just to make sure uh, that IMF financing does not ultimately go to repay creditors, um, you know, that are the, the ones that have the arrears to whom the borrower owes. Um, there's additional ways in which the IMF can continue to help in the context of, of uh, some things that we discussed. You know, one is they might engage with creditor countries and include it to the extent there are institutional frictions, these sort of details that, uh, think be an effective response and coordination uh, with other multilateral bodies. Um, and then uh, they also can augment the efforts I mentioned that borrowers can really lead in terms of developing their own capacity building. You know, we're very supportive of the IMF's continued investment into uh, you know, uh, debt transparency on both the creditor and borrower side initiatives um, and making sure that, again, tools to uh, evaluate um, you know, potential uh, uh, borrowing and, and do all they can to minimize the chances that any agreements they reach um, end up putting them in a bad position down the road. That's very clear and detailed. And in turn, but I want to ask you more about U.S. policy as well. I mean, we have seen, again, in context, we have seen um, various initiatives come out of the NSC, the NEC, the White House, and Treasury. Um, to use more interventionist measures to try to affect Chinese behavior in a host of areas. Are there things in this area where the U.S. government is considering or you think could use other means or even incentives to help get the Chinese position changed? I mean, at, at this stage, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, largely what I had said is, is, is where our focus should be. Um, you know, making the argument, um, explaining, you know, how we see it as to the frictions on making progress of initiatives that we've agreed together with China to pursue, such as the common framework, um, and enabling, you know, kind of borrowers and the IMF to, to contribute as best they can to, to that process to make sure everyone's in a position to move forward as quickly as possible. China question, and before turning again to the systemic issues, um, uh, how does you see? China's Belt and Road Initiative over the medium term, meaning not just this year's negotiations, but in the coming years, uh, affecting the resolution of sovereign debt issues. I think mean, one way of interpreting it is you pointed to the fact that Chinese lending has become a huge share and a growing share of total bilateral lending. 
and maybe belt and road effects, how that's done and how much is done. Another possibility, maybe wishful, um, is that borrowers are seeing some of the nasty strings that come with belt and road loans some of the time. Um, and that maybe the, the borrowers will, in addition to all the good governance general behavior that you've spoken about, um, choose to forego some Chinese loans, or like you said, force the Chinese to have different standards. Does it matter if the U.S. and other non-China G20 governments increase their own lending, or is or, or do we need to beat something with with something? Um, I mean, I you know, uh, at risk of repeating a little bit, uh, the way we see it, you know. Borrowers get to make their own decisions. Uh, they have agency over their own borrowing. The public good uh, that we think it's useful to provide um, is an articulation as we've seen it, including from recent experience, on how you know uh, some instances of borrowing included contractual clauses and elements. You know whether we're talking about the escrow accounts or the non-disclosure accounts. Um, you know that can can result in, in significant distress uh, for the borrowing countries. Um, and so, you know, all the kind of efforts that I described in this, this speech itself are in part aimed at uh, sort of increasing information and building awareness and hopefully building capacity to, to evaluate uh, some of the issues that can be associated with those sorts of terms. The last part of your question, I also finished a little bit uh, at the end of my speech mentioning um, our efforts uh, to improve the scale of high quality development financing uh, that can be provided, for instance, through the multilateral development banks. This will be a major focus uh, of Treasury's engagements in the upcoming bank fund meetings. I don't wanna get too far ahead of that, um, but it's certainly the case uh, that you know, one, one benefit of providing high quality um, development financing at a much larger scale um, is that it can essentially provide a, a better menu of options uh, for emerging markets and low-income countries, um, you know that that hopefully um, reveals for them what sorts of arrangements are are their best interest. Thank you, and I just want to emphasize that my questions are in no way intended to dismiss the importance of the transparency measures you mentioned. You rightly cited our colleague at Peterson, Anna Gelpern, and her co-authors who've done a lot of work on the power of transparency and borrowers revealing, uh, I think Cameron comes to mind, um, revealing terms of bad lending. And so that is important. Um, so now moving more broadly, as you said, we're coming up on the um, Fund Bank annual meetings and Treasury has a broader agenda than just the agenda you spoke about in your, in your speech. I mean, with interest rates rising so markedly from the Fed and elsewhere, Obviously, there's a lot of pressure on indebted countries, particularly low and middle income economies. Uh, there is an issue where Democrats in Congress have proposed legislation that would suspend the IMF lending surcharges. Um, how do you, how does Treasury see this? Is this a good proposal? Is this a proposal you oppose? What will, does it matter what the IMF surcharges are? So the IMF surcharges, um, you know, it's part of the IMF's risk management uh, framework toolbox. Um, these are surcharges that apply, um, you know, when a, a level of borrowing, when a borrower has a level that exceeds, I, I think it's something like 185% or, or thereabouts of their quota. Um, and it's a way to um, incent swift repayment um, by borrowers on their loans, which is, which is of course, uh, consistent with the temporary nature of, of IMF lending. Um, it builds up, you know, the IMF's precautionary balances and is important uh, protection for, for IMF shareholders um, to make sure that we can we can keep the IMF funded and it can provide its uh, lender of last resort um, uh, activities. Uh, it, it's worth noting that that even if you take into account these surcharges, IMF lending is on far better terms than market for the vast majority of borrowers um, that actually uh, borrow from the IMF. Um, it's also worth highlighting that borrowing from the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust um, or in the future from the Resilient and Sustainability Trust uh, won't be subject to, to these surcharges. Um, and so these surcharges wouldn't apply to, to the lowest income countries borrowing from the IMF uh, in those programs. And um, 
So, so as a result, I, I don't uh, think at this time we, we need to reevaluate uh, uh, you know, the surcharge uh, policies of the IMF. Thank you. You, you mentioned just a minute ago um, the Treasury's positive pursuit of more high funds for high quality development lending. Um, any other key issues heading into the annual meetings or the D7, D20 meetings that you would like to highlight in your remit as nominee for assistant secretary? Sure, no, you know, more broadly, the, the, the team's goals as we approach uh, uh, the annual meetings include, um, you know, focusing on what we can do to uh, address food insecurity, which uh, as, as you also alluded to earlier is a, a critical and important issue. Um, we, we understand that the IMF is looking into possibly standing up a food security window. Um, and we, uh, I expect uh, that as we get more details, we'll, we'll be supportive. Um, we are also looking into ways in which we can continue to support Ukraine. And we'll be talking to our partners about short-term assistance that can be provided uh, and that we have been providing uh, to Ukraine. Um, so it can help uh, you know, Ukraine push back against Russia's brutal, brutal and, and horrific invasion. Uh, also talking with partners about how to think about medium and longer term issues as Ukraine hopefully shortly moves toward, toward reconstruction. We're acutely aware of energy and security issues, um, particularly in Europe, but, but around the world. Um, there's sort of two, two tracks that we're pursuing there. In the short run, one key policy that we'll be engaging with partners at the bank fund meetings on is the G7 um, uh, price cap uh, for Russian oil exports. Um, the idea there is to, to achieve two goals. One, to maintain and make sure that, that Russian or do, do what we can to have Russian oil continue to hit the global market, to keep prices down, which is really important for low-income countries and middle-income countries that have a lot of fiscal strains right now, a lot of strains on their uh, terms of trade and their import prices. Um, but at the same time, making sure that we continue to put uh, as much fiscal pressure on Putin um, and his ability to um, you know, pursue and continue pursuing this horrific war. And so the idea is by uh, forcing a, a price cap, making sure that oil only hits global markets um, if in fact it's sold below uh, the price cap level is, is the way in which we're thinking of, of uh, achieving those uh, goals together with our partners. Um, that's obviously something that can help in the short run. In the medium and long term, I think if anything, this episode has just made crystal clear uh, the vulnerabilities that emerge if you rely uh, as an energy supplier on countries, a very concentrated set of countries, some of which don't share uh, our values, not to mention the fact that, of course, uh, you know, continued use of fossil fuels is not consistent with uh, our protection of, of the planet and our climate transition goals. And so a lot of our work um, at uh, the annual meetings will also center around our medium and long run climate action objectives where we're all really thrilled uh, that the president signed the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 a month or two ago. Um, it's got a lot of um, elements on the demand and on the supply side that really go uh, you know, a long way towards bridging the gap toward uh, the emissions targets that President Biden set for 2030. And many of those actions are, if anything, complementary to actions that uh, our partners uh, will hopefully also be taking. So coordinating around that process will also be an important part of our, of our bank fund uh, messaging and meetings and uh, goals. Thank you for setting all that out. I'll just do a shameless plug for our senior fellow here, Peterson, Stephen Fries, who's done his independent analysis of the Inflation Reduction Act from a climate perspective and frankly agrees that there's probably a lot more there uh, in terms of the impact on climate change in the, in the bill than some people appreciate. And, Obviously, whatever specifics, we hope to see progress. Finally, and you've been very generous with your time and insights, Brent. Um, you raised Russia's barbaric invasion of Ukraine. Um, it was a very big image and I think quite inspiring last April at the spring meetings to see Secretary Yellen lead a walkout of finance ministers and central bank governors from democratic economies um, from the meetings when the Russian officials came in. Um, Russia, however, does remain a G20 member. Uh, the current and the next two G20 pairs, Indonesia, India, Brazil, have all made clear they 
actively want Russia at the table and participating in the G20. So as you're doing work on multiple fronts, at least how do you and Treasury think about navigating a G20 or making use of the G20 constructively where Russia is going to be there, but the decisions of that government are obviously quite hateful to a lot of us. Yeah. I'd start by just uh, agreeing. I, I thought that uh, the Secretary's uh, you know, actions there and, and those of uh, you know, her colleagues um, that walked out, that was very, very powerful. Um, Stepping back from specific tactics, I mean, it is clear more generally that uh, you know business can't go on as usual in the G20. Um, you know, while there's this this brutal war that Russia is conducting uh, against Ukraine, the good news is the large majority of G20 members uh, see things like we do in that regard, um, and so you know Russia and Putin have been unable to use the G20 as a vehicle. Uh, to transmit misinformation, um, either regarding, you know, some of the, the horrific acts that they've um, uh, uh, persecuted in, in, in Ukraine, or the spillovers that have been caused by, by their decision uh, to invade. Um, you know, the, the, the bottom line is, uh, you know, Russia has not, in my view, so far been able to, and I don't believe in the future will be able to veto uh, essentially the important work that we need to get done uh, in, in multilaterals like the IMF and the G20. And so, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged at least by that fact and, and looking forward, uh, I hope that we can, we can continue to make sure that we're still making progress on G20, um, um, you know, in, initiatives uh, while making sure that uh, none of our efforts are distorted in those sorts of ways by, by actions by Russia. Well, thank you again, Brent, for joining us back at Peterson now with your official hat on. Um, we've been fortunate today to have a speech and discussion with Brent Nyman, who serves as counselor to the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury and is the Biden administration's nominee for the Assistant Secretary for International Finance and the Deputy Undersecretary. Um, this has been fascinating and important. And we at the Pearson Institute are following, as I hope all our audience will, with great interest the progress you make with the common framework and with the host of related issues you spoke about today. Thanks so much for having me. It was nice to speak with you. This meeting is adjourned. Okay, you can turn off your mic.